to welcome you to this year's William R. Stewart Memorial Lecture for Labor and Employment Law. Uh, we had a wonderful future lecture last week. Um, we're going to have a terrific uh, lecture today, and I hope you keep on your calendar next Wednesday when we have an, our next uh, endowed speaker series. Uh, these endowed lectures are important to us because not only do we get to hear some of the sort of brightest uh, minds that are doing some really interesting research uh, throughout the nation, but we also get to celebrate uh, the accomplishments of some of our most well-known and prestigious graduates, and that's certainly true uh, with the Bill Stewart lecture. Uh, established in 2006, this lecture honors the late Bill Stewart, who is one of our most distinguished graduates. He was a veteran of the United States Army. He earned his JD here in 1959, and 40 years later was inducted into the school's Academy of Law Alumni Fellows, which is the highest and most distinguished honor uh, our school can bestow upon any of our graduates. For 34 years, he was a lawyer with the National Labor Relations Board, and he was the board's first African-American chief counsel. His leadership and commitment to excellence prompted President Bill Clinton to award him the President's Award for Distinguished Federal Civilian Service and to characterize his contributions to the NLRB as unparalleled. At the time, he was the first and only NLRB employee. It's an entire 69-year history to receive this honor, the highest honor that any civil servant uh, can receive in our government. Past Stewart lectures have included some of the most prominent labor and employment scholars in the nation. Uh, they include Laura Cooper from the University of Minnesota, uh, Martin Matlin from Chicago Kent College of Lawyer, Matt Finken from the University of Illinois, uh, Sam Bagansos from Michigan Law, and our last speaker last year, uh, Cynthia Eslin from NYU. This year, we're very pleased that Professor Ford will be given this year's Stewart Lecture, and I'm pleased to, at this point, introduce Professor Dow Schmidt, who will introduce uh, Professor Before. Yeah. Well, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our guest today, uh, Professor Stephen Beffert. He's the Gray, Plant, Moody, Moody, and Bennett Professor of Law, not just one Moody's, but two <laughs> in the title, uh, at the University of Minnesota. Uh, I've known Stephen for, uh, geez, a couple of decades now. Uh, he's a uh, well-known national authority on labor and employment law. Uh, he's published, uh, authored over uh, six books and more than 60 articles on the topic, and they range anywhere from uh, Covenants Not to Compete to the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, very broadly written in uh, many areas of, of employment law. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Arbitrators. Uh, he's the past chair of the Minnesota State Bar Association Labor and Employment Law Section. Uh, he's the secretary, uh, or he has been the secretary of the American Bar Association's Labor and Employment Law Section and he currently serves as a co-editor on the section-sponsored ABA journal on labor and employment law, which is a very important uh, publication, for, not only for, for uh, academics in the area of labor and employment law, but also for practitioners. Uh, we met first, uh, I think, when we were both uh, members of the labor law group, and I was chair first, but he is now co-chair of the labor law group, which is an esteemed uh, group of scholars in labor and employment law. And today he's going to talk about a very important subject, the declining fortunes of American workers. This is a subject that comes up in both my labor and employment law cases, uh, classes, and you can't really understand a lot about what's driving the current issues in labor and employment law or even politics in general in the country without understanding uh, what's happening to American workers. So without any further ado, uh, Professor, Professor Stephen Beffert. Well, thanks, Ken, uh, and, and Dean Parrish. It's uh, great to be here. I'm honored and delighted three different ways. Uh, way number one, uh, that list of names of who have delivered the Stewart Lecture in the past, that's the cream of the crop in terms of our field, and I'm flattered to be invited uh, to participate. Uh, second honor is uh, that Ken invited me. Uh, Ken and I are fellow travelers in the labor law group in many conferences, and I'm, uh, I hope you all know just how significant of a scholar he is in the field. He's a, he's a real leader, uh, and I'm proud to, to call him a friend. And uh, I'm happy for a third reason. Uh, it's 15 degrees warmer here than it is, than it is in Minnesota, uh, sort of a spring uh, vacation, if you will. Uh, this drizzle that's falling would be whiter and harder uh, back home. So, uh, so I'm happy to be here. 
Uh, the topic, as Ken indicated, is the declining fortunes of American workers. It's uh, based on a law review article that should come out in about a month from the Florida Law Review. Uh, and it's actually part of a bigger project. Um, in 2000, I published uh, an article uh, that tried to assess the status of workers and employment relationship in, uh, in America at the millennium. Uh, and uh, looking at uh, the balance of power between employees and employers and uh, the status of American employees vis-a-vis employees of other countries, I reached two conclusions. Conclusion number one is that uh, American workers are subject to far less uh, legal regulation than our employees in other countries, other industrialized countries at least. And number two, that uh, an imbalance has developed in terms of the relative power of uh, employers and employees or workers in the United States. And as I said there, uh, uh, the balance of power is badly skewed in favor of employers. Um, what I'm doing in this new article in my presentation today is reassessing uh, this status of American workers in light of six dimensions. And I'm looking at what's happened since the year 2000. Now that we're almost two decades into the, into the current century, uh, are things getting better or worse for American workers? So my topics are workforce attachment, union management relations, employment security, income inequality, balancing work and family, and retirement security. Now I wanna say straight off uh, that the economy's humming along, and I recognize that unemployment is uh, near a historical low, and in those two respects, American workers are benefiting, clearly. But what I'm looking at here is the relationship between employers and employees and the legal status of uh, employees in terms of their rights and obligations. And that's what I'm trying to measure is that relational status getting better or getting worse. So let's start with the first dimension, workforce attachment. Uh, for many decades, uh, employers used internal labor markets, uh, particularly following the New Deal era. What's an internal labor market? Basically, employers hire talent, train that talent, promote that talent, and provide uh, benefits and pay commensurate with retaining those employees. So it's, it's uh, raising one's own workforce internally. Um, that's no longer the predominant model. Uh, beginning somewhere around 1980, we saw uh, the emergence of a global economy. Uh, the factors of increasing trade, increasing technology has led to greater capital mobility where employers can do business, uh, where business is done best. Uh, and part of that flexibility for employers in the global economy is using external labor markets rather than internal labor markets. So rather than hiring people and keeping them around when there's a slow downturn in the economy, employers increasingly are hiring as needed and terminating when not needed. Uh, they're relying on training from outside and uh, the flexible hiring and layoff practices clearly are beneficial to many employers and I will also acknowledge that they're beneficial to uh, some workers as well, but not all. Uh, one of the flexible uh, employment relationship uh, arrangements is the, what's called the contingent workforce. Who's a contingent worker? It's someone who does not have a long-term attachment to an employing entity. It's helpful to think of these workers in two different categories. Some are not employees. They are independent contractors or they are uh, workers who are leased from a staffing firm. Um, other workers are true employees. They're under the control of the employing entity, but they may have a short-term attachment either because they're temporary workers or they have part-time employment. 
like I said, uh, flexible work practices are, are beneficial for many employers. My oldest daughter is a freelance journalist. She enjoys the freedom that comes with being a, quote, <laughs> contingent, unquote, worker. But by and large, many contingent workers have not chosen their status. They are in jobs that they can get or they're in multiple contingent jobs. In general, and this isn't universal, but in general, contingent workers earn less pay and receive less benefits than do full-time workers. Uh, clearly, less job security and uh, access to union representation. This isn't a legal obstacle for, uh, well, it is for independent contractors, but uh, short-term workers tend not to unionize. That's just the practical reality. And the last bullet point I've got here is less regulatory protection. This is an important piece of the puzzle here in that under American labor and employment law, only people who are classified as employees are subject to legal regulation or protection, if you will. So uh, an individual can't sue for sexual harassment unless they're an employee. They can't claim unemployment compensation. They're not covered by uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, pension protection under ERISA. We have a sharp regulatory divide between people who are employees and people who are not. Uh, that leads to difficult issues about who are employees. And the current principal test for determining that is the common law right of control. Does the employer control the means and, and manner of performing work? And it's a 10 factor test. Now, any test that has 10 factors, um, difficult to apply. You know, it's difficulty to predict whether someone is, uh, uh, is an employee or not. Microsoft hired these, what they call freelancers, uh, had them work alongside regular employees, and lo and behold, they got sued. And the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals said, yes, they are employees, regardless of what label you put on, and yes, you owe them these benefits. Uh, there is an incentive for employers to classify workers as independent contractors to avoid uh, legal regulation. And sometimes the world of misclassification uh, puts people on the wrong side of the fence from what might be reality. So uh, there is some uh, inclination towards manipulation of these 10 factor tests. And finally, the current employee test does not necessarily correlate with, with the basic purpose of employment regulation, which is to help uh, protect people who are dependent on other entities for their work. Uh, some independent contractors are dependent workers. Well, how many people are in the contingent workforce and is this workforce growing or shrinking? So the Government Accountability Office of the US government has measured uh, what they consider to be, they called it non-full-time workers uh, defining the contingent workforce is not an easy deal. But according to the GAO, approximately 26% of U.S. workers were in the contingent category in the year 2000. They say it is now 40.4%. That's quite a big jump. Um, and one of the biggest pieces of that jump is people who work in the gig economy. You, you know better than I do what the gig economy is, uh, given your age and my age, but we've got individual workers who uh, work with consumers uh, via a digital platform. And one of the issues here, well, well, first, there's an estimated 14 million gig workers in the United States at the current time. That's a lot, and that's a big component of the contingent workforce. Uber. Uh, by itself has 327,000 drivers, most of them part-time, but not all. Uh, so this is a growing group of the contingent economy. And there's litigation all over the country, particularly in California, about whether Uber is an employer, whether the drivers are subject to the legal regulation that I mentioned previously. 
If you ask Uber, the answer is no, they're not an employer. Uh, Uber is simply uh, a digital matchmaking service where the drivers can figure out um, for themselves, uh, use their own cars, decide on their own work hours, and they're paid by the job. But if you look from another angle, you'll see that uh, Uber sets the compensation rate for the drivers, determines uh, passenger pickups and has the power to uh, hire and fire, if you will, in terms of uh, permitting someone to continue doing that work. Uh, so we don't know whether Uber is uh, an employer or not, and much hinges on that, although maybe more hinges on it than, than should. Uh, so if we look at the growing number of uh, contingent workers I've got this good, bad, and ugly sort of summary. Good, it's a flexible option for supplemental earnings for individual workers. Bad, uh, a colleague from St. Louis University described, uh, gig work is modern day piecework characterized by de-skilled tasks and low pay. Miriam Cherry called it essentially the same as someone doing homework on textile knitting uh, back in the 1820s. Um, and one commentator has said, if tax, task rabbit is the future of work, we're all screwed. Uh, well, they said it, not me. But if you, on this first dimension, if growing contingent work causes more problems than solves them, uh, for workers, at least, uh, according to this dimension, things have gotten somewhat worse since the year 2000. Let's look at the, a second dimension. This is labor management relations. Now, I want to want to underscore that whether a worker is unionized or not unionized is not inherently a positive or negative thing. Uh, what I'm looking at is whether or not employees who might want to be members of a union are being thwarted or have too many obstacles to reach that, uh, uh, to reach that goal. Uh, and studies I have read show that uh, over 40% of American workers uh, would be interested in joining a union, but only 10.7% currently are represented by a union. Um, According to labor, there are at least four major flaws in the current labor management system. Um, a lack of deterrent remedies for unlawful anti-union tactics. So there's a organizing election in a workplace, as an example. Uh, the employer fires a union supporter or organizer. Uh, the remedy, that's unlawful, it's an unfair labor practice, but the remedy is back pay. There is no, um, there is no uh, uh, punitive damages or compensatory damages as they are under Title VII. If a union is certified and bargaining is not happening in good faith, there's foot dragging or surface bargaining as it's called, the remedy is go out there and try it again. There is no other further penalty, monetary or otherwise. Um, in the event of a strike, and they are happening uh, with great infrequency these days, uh, employers have the right to permanently replace the strikers uh, until the strike is over and there's unconditional uh, offer to return to work. Even then, as long as the positions are filled by the replacements, there's no need to displace them. Uh, the strikers just get their jobs back if there are openings. Uh, and in the event of a lockout, and these are happening with greater frequency when an employer locks out workers, uh, the employer can use temporary replacements as a way of uh, continuing production. <clears throat> in the public sector, we've seen a particularly big slide in terms of union rights on the worker side of the coin. Uh, in since 2011, 13 states have adopted legislation restricting uh, the right to collective bargain or to use arbitration to support bargaining demands. Uh, Wisconsin and Iowa are the most far reaching. They've essentially banned collective bargaining uh, other than for non-publics, I mean, other than for public safety workers, police and fire. 
Uh, Indiana, I believe it was 2005, uh, Governor Daniels uh, uh, lifted the executive order that uh, enabled workers, state workers to collectively bargain. And in 2011, the scope of permissible bargaining for teachers in Indiana was, was narrowed. This last bullet point in this slide, again, is a public sector development. It's the Janus case. It is currently pending before the United States Supreme Court, and it raises the question about whether uh, a union can uh, collect uh, fair share fees from non-union members who they represent in collective bargaining and contract administration. Uh, under the 1977 Abood case, the Supreme Court said, yes, uh, those workers get the benefits of collective bargaining. They should pay not union dues, but a lesser amount of, of uh, fair share fees. <clears throat> um, the issue before the Supreme Court is whether that uh, uh, mandatory fees are uh, infringe the First Amendment rights of the non-union members. And I think most everyone, I think Ken and I would agree, uh, it, believes that it's going to be a five to four decision saying that such fees are not permissible, uh, which would essentially mean that the public sector throughout the United States will be a right to work state. Uh, and it will clearly have a negative impact on public sector unions, their power, their density, and um, their clout. This last slide on union management relations uh, just has some numbers, and it's the union density numbers of workers who are represented by unions. And you see each bullet point uh, has a declining percentage, 10.7 currently. And if you look only at the private sector, it's less than 7%. So uh, if uh, with the decline of unionization and the difficulty of obtaining union status uh, suggests that uh, the second dimension workers are having trouble as well. Um, dimension number three, let me get on the right page here. So I call this employment security. What's the nature of the relationship between employers and employees? In most of the industrialized world, uh, there are statutes that provide that employers can dismiss an employee only for cause. There must be some valid reason. Now, lack of work is a valid reason, uh, but not liking one's uh, uh, shoe color is not. Um, United States does not have that system. We have what's called the employment at will rule, meaning that uh, employer can hire and fire for any reason, good, bad, or none. Uh, uh, we have a host of exceptions, though. It's sort of an inefficient system because we've got a basic rule, but then a lot of exceptions like anti-discrimination statutes and the like. And these are enforced in various forms. Could be court, arbitration, administrative agency. Uh, I call it a maze of possible forms. In the 1980s, uh, as corporations were merging and moving, uh, the courts uh, recognized three new causes of action that limited uh, the at-will rule. One was the public policy tort. So an employer cannot fire someone for blowing the whistle on illegal activities or of an employee who refuses to commit an illegal act. We had implied contract claims, and the most common was an employee handbook that detailed policies and procedures and courts said if those policies and procedures are clear enough and specific enough, they are enforceable as a contract. And then finally, we had a covenant of good faith and fair dealing, which basically recognized that an employer could not, uh, in bad faith, frustrate a contractual expectation. If they did so, this covenant was breached. Um, since 2000, we have seen increasing restrictions on these three common law claims. Let me jump to the middle one, the implied contract. Uh, a handbook that's specific is a, uh, can be contractually enforceable. 
But if, in, if a disclaimer is added to the handbook that says this is not meant to be a contract, even if it has specific promises in it, it is not a contract, it's not enforceable. Um, top line, top bullet point, public policy tort. Uh, a number of jurisdictions have restricted when this tort is actionable. So in my home state, the Supreme Court said, well, uh, blowing the whistle on a legal activity is, is uh, actionable, but if the whistleblower uh, commits a mistake of law, that is blows the whistle on something they don't like, but it turns out not to be illegal, no claim. And then the covenant of good faith and fair dealing has not been recognized by many states. I think it's only about 10 at present. And um, the vast majority of those 10 recognize only contract damages. And uh, to the extent that the alleged contract that's being frustrated is a contract to continue uh, uh, employment, it's redundant of the implied contract claim. Uh, so all three of these claims have really dwindled in terms of their uh, importance. And I think on this dimension, we are again seeing uh, a decline in worker fortunes. Fourth, uh, uh, fourth dimension is income. Uh, to what extent do we have is income equality growing or shrinking in the United States? And I don't think I'm, I'm surprising any of you here by saying, well, it has been, it has been growing. Uh, income inequality is measured by quintiles. And a quintile is 20 percentage groups, five quintiles amongst all household. And the highest earning quintile of households uh, makes more than 50% of the total income of the United States. Uh, and the bottom earning quintile of households earns just 3%. Um, well, how, has that been growing or shrinking? And you notice that, uh, that the earnings of the higher quintile has been growing rapidly, that of the bottom earning quintile has been growing much more slowly. Since 2000, the lowest quintile, uh, its aggregate income has fallen from 3.6% of total in income to 3.1%. And for the highest earning group, it's also increased by uh, a very similar uh, amount from 49.8 to 51.2. And this last one, uh, CEOs receive income that is 277 times that of an average worker. And that's a sevenfold increase since 1979. Um, now, I don't think anyone expects every CEOs to earn the same thing as uh, as the custodial staff, but the fact that income inequality has been increasing, uh, I think is, is a problem. Uh, and the tax reform bill passed last year probably aggravates that. I mean, there might be good things in that tax bill, but most of the breaks go to people who earn uh, upper middle and, and higher income, and that likely will exacerbate the gap between those who make a lot and those who don't make much. Should we worry about this? Well, uh, I have seen studies that indicate that the American dream of moving from the bottom to the middle or maybe higher is getting harder uh, to accomplish now than it used to be. Um, and the social instability of the a widening gap between people who have and people who don't is something I think to worry about more broadly. So this fourth dimension, uh, we've got a decline here as well. Number five, uh, work, balancing work and family. Uh, you know, when I was a little kid, Ozzie and Harriet was on TV. Ozzie went to work, we, we don't know where, but he went to work every day. Harriet stayed home and took care of everything and uh, that's the way the world worked. If the beeve was in trouble, uh, that's a different show, isn't it? <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Uh, but women are in the workforce. Uh, single parents, whether they're men or women, are in the workforce and balancing work and family is an increasing struggle in the United States. 
And what I call the worker time crunch isn't limited to just caregiver employees. It's a fact that over the last 30 years, the amount of time that American workers spend on employment uh, has grown uh, exponentially. So the average US full-time worker now puts in more than 1,900 hours of work per year. And this is about 300 hours on the average higher than what uh, our counterparts in Western Europe work. If you look at the list of industrialized countries uh, around the world, uh, US really ranks third in the amount of hours work. Korea and Singapore are ahead of us, but that's, that's it. Uh, so here's a slide that looks at uh, average hours for dual earner families, and it, it shows that there's been an increase of 388 hours over the uh, a, uh, 30 year span from 1979 to 2010. Well, why are American workers spending more time at work? Well, a couple things. Beginning in 1980, the, the job market and the economy for blue collar, particularly male workers, started to decline, deteriorate. Some of that corresponds with decline in unionization. Some of it uh, corresponds with uh, businesses moving from the Rust Belt to the Sun Belt and elsewhere. Uh, but many more employees needed to spend more time at work just to maintain a standard of living. Uh, employers, meanwhile, uh, had an incentive to, to squeeze up more hours from workers as a way of dealing with rising benefit costs. So think of this. Uh, you've got uh, three employees and you need, uh, an employer needs extra work accomplished at work. If you hire a fourth worker, you've got to pay that worker benefits. And in most workplaces, that's about 30% of total compensation. But if you squeeze more work out of the three existing workers, the benefit costs are static. So there's an incentive to squeeze out more hours rather than do new hires. And again, the global economy really does put genuine pressure on employers to compete not just across the street or across the nation, but around the world. And getting more productivity through more work hours is, uh, is a means of doing that. Now, US labor and employment law uh, enables extra work to a certain extent. So the Fair Labor Standards Act that governs minimum wage and overtime work requires time and a half pay for work beyond 40 hours for blue collar workers, but for white collar exemptions, that's professional, executive, and managerial workers, uh, there's no cap on how many hours can be worked and there's no requirement of overtime pay. And um, Family Medical Leave Act uh, does authorize uh, time off for uh, family care, for uh, care for a sick, family member, but no pay is required. Uh, most countries do require some amount uh, of, of pay. Four states now require uh, paid leave. Uh, but the fact that there is no pay means that particularly lower income workers tend not to use FMLA leave because they can't afford to. Well, since 2000, the average number of hours worked by American workers has actually declined. Why? Um, it's uh, a factor of the Great Recession that there was a lot of unemployment and less work to do. Uh, now, I think that's probably bouncing back now that the economy is humming, humming along. But if we consider working extra hours to be a negative connotation for workers in that it stresses out uh, uh, family members and leaves less time for, for family care. Uh, this is the one dimension that has not declined, uh, although I think it probably will in the future, but uh, thank you, Great Recession, uh, for helping on, on this. Uh, so the last dimension I wanna talk about deals with retirement security. And retirement security is uh, increasingly important. Uh, 
are increasingly uh, pressurized because you've got a growing uh, bubble of uh, baby boom retirees and a lesser cohort of active workers who's funding the retirement in part for these retirees. Uh, and that, that's the pressure, more retirees, less workers. Uh, the retirement security uh, uh, system is often described as a three-legged stool with social security, pensions, and personal savings being the primary components of retirement security. Each of these is in trouble, at least in part. Uh, Social Security. We all know that Social Security uh, has a looming crisis where the trust funds will run out of money. Uh, currently, we have a surplus, $1.5 trillion. That's the good news. But uh, the amount going out is now exceeding the amount coming in. And it won't be long, 2020, before, well, by 2020, outlays will exceed inflows. And by 2033, the trust funds accumulated will be exhausted. That doesn't mean that Social Security disappears. What it means is that Social Security, unless there's a change, can only fund on a pay-as-we-go basis, which is predicted to be only 79% of, uh, of benefits that are promised. Uh, and a, we have a 75-year shortfall of uh, $4 trillion. So Social Security and 45% of retirees uh, spend over 90% of Social Security as their sole retirement asset. Uh, so that's a, this is a big issue. Pensions. Uh, an employer-provided pension is another uh, leg of the stool. Uh, those who have pensions, we're lucky. Uh, over half of all American workers are not covered by a pension. Uh, those who are tend to fall into two different categories. Uh, defined benefit plans where the employer funds the pension and promises a certain amount and accordingly bears the risk of loss if the market goes down. Uh, increasingly, uh, pensions are turning into defined contribution plans instead of defined benefit plans. In a defined contribution plan, uh, the benefits are determined by how the market does with the contributions. And contributions are usually both from employers and from employees. So it's the employees who bear the benefit of gains, the risk of loss uh, in the event of a market downturn. In addition to uh, a lack of benefit coverage, some of the problems in the pension world are defined benefits are, tend to be underfunded and uh, because many employers are converting defined pensions into cash balance type plans, uh, there's a loss of anticipated value for older workers in those conversions. On the defined contribution front, uh, probably the biggest problem is a lack of participation. Uh, employees usually don't have to sign up and many younger workers don't, thinking like I did, a few years ago that I'm never going to get old. So uh, who needs to pay into that? Uh, meanwhile, with people changing jobs, there's a great temptation to take the, uh, the money out of the 401k and buy that boat that you always wanted. Uh, but boat's nice, but it doesn't leave money for retirement. And then the last problem here is over-concentration in company stock, the Enron debacle of what, 15 years ago? Uh, the whole pension plan was essentially devoted to Enron company stock, and when the company went bankrupt, so did the pension plan of the employees. Uh, public sector pensions is particularly problematic right now. <clears throat> ERISA doesn't apply to public pensions, so the funding level requirements are not there, and uh, there is massive underfunding uh, a $1, one trillion dollar shortfall in state pension systems at current. State of Illinois, only 42 cents of, of uh, promised benefits are in the budgetary pipeline. Uh, so there, there's a looming, a looming problem in, in that arena. Uh, personal savings rate, 
experts say that to match Social Security and pensions, individuals should put aside approximately 15% of their disposable income. Uh, but we see over time that that tends not to be met. And in fact, before the Great Recession, uh, people were uh, saving at a negative rate, meaning the credit cards were uh, taking control. It's bounced back now to about a 5% savings rate, but uh, that's really not enough for many retirees. So the desired goal, uh, my, my pension planner tells me, is when you retire to have sufficient income to replace 75% of pre-retirement earnings, the notion is you'll be paying less tax in retirement, so you uh, need somewhat less money. But studies show that only 45% of baby boomers are likely to hit this target, and that 50% of all workers are likely to run out of, out of assets before running out of time. Well, what I've got left, and I, I've got a few slides that deal with possible reforms that could rebalance uh, the workforce relationship. But I want to say two things generally. One, there acknowledgedly is not a political will to accomplish this right now. Uh, maybe there will someday, but I, I don't think it's today. And number two, these reforms I don't think can be too ham-fisted. I mean, I don't think we can mandate income inequality or mandate union membership or outlaw the contingent workforce. What I think is needed is meaningful and fair access to benefits and opportunities for American workers. So a couple things. In regard to uh, workforce attachment, the contingent workforce, uh, I think certain uh, protections like ban on sexual harassment should simply not be tied to employment. Uh, I, an Uber driver should not be sexually harassed even if they're not classified as an employee. And benefits should be made more portable as workers travel from one job to the next, maybe their pension system should travel along with them. Management, unit management relations, uh, again, it doesn't make sense to impose unions, but to uh, provide vehicles for free choice uh, is important. So a card-based certification system rather than uh, an election with uh, the type of uh, arm twisting that goes on currently, limiting the use of replacement employees, enhancing unfair labor practice remedies, I think could enable more free choice. In terms of uh, income inequality, raising the minimum wage, expanding the earned income tax credit, and adopting a more progressive tax code, all of which could enable more opportunity. It's not going to result in total equality, but it could help. In terms of uh, the worker time crunch, paid leave for caregivers certainly would be a beneficial reform. It comes with a cost, of course. Uh, and four states have now adopted right to request statutes, and a lot of European uh, countries have as well. A right to request statute basically requires employers to meet with an employee who wants a modified work schedule. They don't have to agree to it, and you can't go to court to say employer had a bad reason for denying it, but just the evidence shows that just talking can uh, accomplish a lot more flexibility in terms of work schedules. Uh, and finally, in terms of retirement security, uh, we need to save Social Security, and uh, I would suggest we could do it uh, rather easily by uh, raising the retirement age a little and raising the ceiling on uh, uh, Social Security withholding contributions a little. Now, why, if it's so easy, why isn't it happening? Democrats won't vote for uh, increase in retirement age. Republicans won't vote for an increase in the withholding tax. Um, but I think if we did a little on each side of that coin, we could save Social Security. And I would encourage personal savings by enhancing the savers credit, but I won't get into the, the details on that. Uh, 
I'll wrap up. I, I do want to say that, yes, I understand that these are somewhat pie in the sky um, agenda for reform. It's not going to happen today or tomorrow. But just think back to the 2016 presidential election. Uh, Bernie Sanders would buy into this, and a lot of dumb Donald Trump voters uh, were disaffected with the status quo. And uh, as disaffected people, the amount of people grow. And if, if the workplace balance continues to worsen, that might set up uh, a more incentive for change. Now, I, I'm not praying for uh, a gloomy situation here for things to worsen, but I think uh, at some point in time, we de do need to rebalance workplace equity so that we have more fundamental fairness and so that prosperity is shared broadly. Thank you. I think, uh, I think there is time for questions. Um, and we've got uh, microphones here. If you have a question, just raise your hand and the microphone will magically find you and we can go from there. Thank you very much for that uh, informative, comprehensive uh, talk. And I have just a tiny question. I noticed you used um, the phrase right to work. And I wondered if you thought that was um, an appropriate, <coughs> accurate description of what is at stake and going on and whether it's a phrase that we generally should use and conversation about these issues? Well, that, that's a very good observation. Um, those who favor not collecting such fees call them right to work because it, it, it privileges the right to work without having uh, to pay money to a union. Uh, labor always calls them the so-called right to work statutes uh, because they find that it is a label that doesn't interfere with the right to work. It just uh, enables freeloading, if you will. Uh, so the right to work is a is a loaded term, and maybe it's better off not using. Do you, what do you use, Ken? <laughs> but I think that I think uh, non-union members would find that perhaps pejorative as well from the other side of the table. So, yeah, it's it's a term that is widely used, but sort of unhappily. Other questions? So thank you for the, thank you. Thank you for the lecture. Um, one question I had was, um, and so in the mid 2000s, we were hearing a lot about outsourcing and the effects that, was, that outsourcing was having on labor. Um, but we haven't heard much about it. I mean, we heard Donald Trump talk about it a bit during the election, um, but, but it hasn't been on the radar of Sort of the political discourse as it was during the mid 2000s. And I wanted to just hear from you, your views on how outsourcing um, has affected the labor market. Well, outsourcing has affected a lot. Um, the former uh, secretary, assistant secretary of labor, Weil, what's his first name? Uh, wrote The Fissured Economy. It's a fascinating book where uh, he describes how in industry after industry, uh, businesses have, uh, have outsourced parts of their business, you know, like the janitorial work, like the food service work. And by, through the fissured economy, responsibilities are limited and uh, obligations are spread around. So I, I think outsourcing has continued to grow and maybe it's become so prevalent that it's not a hot button issue, but it, the growth in outsourcing and the growth of the contingent economy uh, have been moving basically in lockstep. Uh, 
so that was a great uh, 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 talk, and I felt like I was uh, listening to a kind of a historical policy uh, uh, talk as opposed to kind of the uh, uh, the uh, fundaments of labor employment. Tell all you're showing these big economic macro uh, trends and suggesting that that our, that our regulatory structure just doesn't fit uh, if we care about worker rights. And I certainly agree uh, with that that uh, that analysis. But as I'm listening to your talk, I'm kind of feeling like the this is this fits the kind of the boiling frog uh, metaphor that over a period of time here, the water is getting really warm on the American worker. But you also say, but there's not political will to change these things. You're just like a, the, uh, and I think what you're getting at, if you think about the uh, the, the framework you set the cycle with the New Deal, is is the economy melts down, people are thrown out of work, and there's no faith. In the in the in the kind of the old order, the old order loses credibility, and we have an appetite for dramatic, you know, kind of policy reshifting. And you're hedging on this, and I think you're you're the the, the reality is, uh, you know, it can get hotter and the frog can die, uh, or 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 maybe the frog will band together and revolt, you know, and there's a revolution, which I doubt will happen. Uh, but there's also the possibility that this system is so out of balance it just melts down. And that political uh, environment, you know, causes a Bernie Sanders to basically get the votes he needs to put forth a new New Deal. So I, I wonder if you'll, if you, if you, and I realize I'm asking you to engage in speculation, but let's talk about an end game here and how this thing gets recentered. Well, you make a very good observation. Uh, yeah, I think the frog is getting hotter, uh, but uh, you know, the New Deal only happened because of the Great Depression. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, right. it was. It wasn't because. Uh, policymakers got together and said, oh, things are headed in the wrong direction. Yeah. Um, and it may be that that uh, nothing is going to change until we have something else that big. And I don't know. You kind of hate to hope for catastrophe, though. Um, but, yeah, you know, in 2008, when Obama was elected, fo following, you know, the huge uh, stock market drop, uh, we – he had majorities in both houses of Congress, and uh, but those melted away pretty quickly. So um, some people perceive that as a time where change would uh, occur, but it, it really melted away. I can't predict what's going to happen. The pendulum is continuing to swing away from workers' rights. Um, what's going to push it back in the other direction? I don't know. The, 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 uh, the pendulum is, I mean, like, if you just look at the last 12 months, that seems to be the uh, the case, <clears throat> but you see some political movement moving toward the other uh, party, and so it's possible that we'll get a political solution uh, here. It's possible. I mean, Bernie Sanders built up a lot of uh, uh, rally halls, and, and his constituents are going to crack at it. So. Well, it is a huge case, uh, and it really does say a lot about uh, at least public sector unions, and this may be a precursor to uh, revisiting uh, so-called right-to-work laws in the private sector as well. Uh, <clears throat> is there any likelihood that, uh, that fair share fees may be upheld? I, I really doubt it. There has been uh, two or three cases that uh, – Justice Alito particularly has been beating the drum uh, to trying to set up uh, the majority to handle this. Uh, and uh, he's had, uh, he's got the votes, let's put it that way. And I, I think uh, President, uh, Justice Gorsuch is the fifth vote. And uh, I would be shocked if, it's, if uh, it comes out the other way. Thanks for the overview. I was wanting to ask you a somewhat narrower question um, about another form of restrictions on workers' rights in the, uh, in, the, in the balance of power, having to do in particular with um, non-competition covenants and um, broad enforcement of trade secret protections. Uh, 
so as to, to restrict movements. As you know, that's, a, that's very decentralized as a topic, uh, governed by state law in most places and with, with wide ranges of rules. I was wondering what you see as the current dynamics in terms of politics, economics, and law in that area, and do you have any hope for, uh, for changes in that area? Yeah, you're right. It is a very uh, varied, variegated, if you will, uh, set of circumstances. Uh, California basically does not enforce non-compete clauses. Uh, and, and Jimmy John's imposes restrictions on sandwich delivery. Exactly. Uh, Jimmy John's has, uh, has its workers on the, the art of sandwich making. Uh, and I know uh, nail salons very commonly do that. And I don't think those covenants uh, will survive legal scrutiny, but they certainly scare off people from uh, leaving jobs and going to competitors. Um, <clears throat> there seems to be some move in effect to, uh, to restrict uh, non-compete agreements that, you know, they are disfavored in many states because they're anti-competitive. <clears throat> um, now, in, in my state, uh, where medical device manufacturing is huge, <clears throat> those companies are suing each other all the time for stealing workers, and you kind of see the investment that they've put in. But when you've got the Jimmy John sandwich makers, boy, I don't, I don't think that should, that should fly. Excuse me. So you mentioned the decline in hours worked um, following the Great Recession, and those seem to be average numbers. And I was wondering if you know anything about the distribution, for example, if that's uh, primarily lower paid employees or higher paid employees or secondary earners. That's a great question, and I don't know the answer to that. <clears throat> um, in term my research on that was on the macro level rather than the uh, sector level. So I, I really don't know the answer to that, but I would, I would guess that there are differences in occupations. So my question is actually directly related to uh, what the <coughs> last uh, person asked. And I think actually there's research by Lonnie Goldman, who's golden, who's an economist on this question suggesting that uh, coming out of the recession, you know, we do obviously have this problem of overwork that your research is showing of the 300 more hours that folks are working since uh, the 1970s, but that there's also a thread of underwork and that that coming out of the recession, that underwork thread has actually disproportionately hit low wage workers. And exactly what you just said, it's in uh, the retail sector and the restaurant sector and sectors like that. So, um, the suggestion is that we might have hit sort of a permanent uh, part-time workforce, and that may be uh, related to some trends that have to do with some of the things you talked about around scheduling flexibility, but actually for employers, it's employer-driven flexibility uh, to be able to have as large of a workforce as possible to plug in at a moment's notice, depending on consumer demand. Um, do you have any thoughts on how you address uh, some of these issues around uh, the sort of changing nature of part-time work and the increasing instability um, for the part-time workforce. Yeah, that's become an increasing <clears throat> problem, uh, particularly for workers who have multiple part-time jobs. Uh, and if schedules are just in time scheduling, so uh, you're scheduled to work on Monday from noon to six, and then the day before, it's, it's changed to Tuesday from uh, 9 to 12. Uh, it becomes very difficult to manage uh, predictable paychecks. It becomes difficult to manage family care. Uh, I believe San Francisco has adopted an ordinance that basically uh, requires employers to post schedules so many days in advance and actually uh, has some monetary penalty for last minute changes. Um, but I don't know of any state that has adopted anything like that. I know in, uh, in Minneapolis, uh, uh, working groups proposed something like that, and uh, the howl that came up from the Chamber of Commerce was enough to kill that within a couple of days. Um, the problem with those solutions are <clears throat> uh, it is 
requiring employers to be less flexible. And that certainly hasn't been the path we've been headed on. I think we're out of time. Okay. Um,